Hey everybody, thank you so much for having me. My name is Pace Morby, and I'm going to show you guys a little bit about my business, introduce myself, and hopefully provide some value to you guys today. I grew up in a family of 12 kids. In fact, I'm third out of 12 children. So there's nine siblings below me, two siblings above me. Now, same mom, same dad, growing up in the same house, 14 people had to live in the same house at the same time. So you can imagine that we had to have bigger houses than most people could normally afford, including my father. My father could not qualify for big enough houses to support his family based on his W-2 income alone. And so my dad always had second jobs. As we all know in this real estate investing world, world that if you have a second job that's under the table or a side business that's under the table and it just is producing a lot of cash, you're not going to be able to qualify for loans. And so my dad growing up, my dad was always buying houses subject to seller finance, lease options, did a lot of creative things. Now, there's a reason why my dad did this is because obvious reasons. He could not afford to go down to a bank and get these loans to purchase large enough houses to fit 14 people in them. So in order to afford those houses or go get them, he had to go ask the seller the homeowners for seller financing, subject to lease options, et cetera. And the way he did that was always going to the rent section in the newspaper. Obviously that was back in the seventies, eighties, nineties and ask landlords, Hey, would you let me rent to own? Or would you seller finance this? Or let me take over the payments on your loan. So I grew up watching this, but here's the funny thing about it. I never knew it was an investment strategy until I was much, much, much older. I wish those were the things I learned from my father, but my dad didn't even look at them as investment strategies. We just looked at that was the only way my dad could afford to buy big enough houses to support our family. So what I really learned from my dad was how to work hard. And I never really understood creative finance until way later in life. And it actually had very little to do with my dad. So today, what I'm going to attempt to do is these next things in the next 45 minutes. Number one, tell you a little bit about who I am, show you what my focus in my business is currently, show you how you can take your existing leads and convert way more, show you some deals and strategies you might not even know about. You might know about sub two, seller finance, lease options, novations. I've got a couple of that some people have never heard of before in this group. I'm then going to hopefully show you the difference between Native Americans and American cowboys and how to use a buffalo properly. I'm also going to open it up to some Q&A. If you guys are watching on YouTube, which you are, obviously, put a question down in the comments below and we will get to you in a little bit. We'll make other YouTube videos about those questions in the future. So here's what I have going on. Last year, I made $1.5 million in net profits on fix and flips. Some of those were innovation agreements. In. Some of those were just cash deals. This year we'll make about $800,000 because the market has changed, right? We, our projected profits got cut in half. Deals that we had in the pipeline got cut down. We do do cash deals. They're just not that exciting to us. Airbnbs, we added 30 Airbnbs to the portfolio, 28 of them through creative finance and two of them through cash. So you can see where my focus really is. My focus is creative finance, not cash deals. Rentals, added 20 traditional rentals to the portfolio, meaning traditional renters are living in them. That's our exit strategy. 15 creative, five with cash. Multiple Multifamily, we are on track to hit a thousand multifamily doors this year. 408 of them are through a fund. So we raised money through private investors and all of that. And 600 of those doors, 105 of those this week, I will close on before the end of the year, all through creative finance, no other investors other than myself. Wholesale, we have a small wholesale operation. We do it about a million dollars in profit every year, about $80,000 or so every single month after all of our expenses. We are adding six new brick and mortar title and escrow businesses to the lineup lending business. We have transaction coordination business. We're launching a reg CF and a reg A fund. Not going to talk about that at all. And then we have other businesses totaling annual sales of $75 million combined between our virtual assistant business and a variety of other things that we added all up. It's about $75 million. So we're doing a lot, as you can imagine. What I want to talk about today are these two things. So what you focus on expands. A lot of people here are doing cash deals. They're doing wholesale. They're doing fixing and flipping. And they're like, why is Pace doing so many creative finance deals? Well, guys, here's what happens. People send me cash deals in my DMs, my emails, and I immediately say, if this is not a creative finance deal, I'm not even going to look at it. I focus on creative finance to the point where I actually repel cash deals. That's just my prerogative. It's what I want to do. I tell people I don't buy cash deals anymore, even though we do. I just prefer to buy cash deals when I'm direct to seller or direct to agent. I realized a long time ago that there are more creative finance deals out there than cash deals if you are focusing properly. Most people think it's the other way around. I'm overwhelmed with creative finance deals. I'm underwhelmed with cash. This is another thing I want to talk about is what we ask our prospect changes the outcome. So if I ask somebody, what do you do for a living? It's going to give a very specific response. Okay. What do you do for a living? You're way too specific. You're asking them to tell you one little thing. Whereas if you told somebody, if you had a 
free day to do anything you wanted, how would you spend that day? You're going to get a completely different response, not even verbally, but you're also going to get a different emotional response and you're framing people and you're making them think and you're making them paint a picture inside of their own brain. That is how we convert creative finance deals way more often than cash deals because those are the questions, those are the nuances and those are the ways that I'm basically moving the seller's momentum to where I want them to go in a way that benefits them and benefits me, obviously. I've been traveling around the country, Jamil, my best friend and I, we've been having a lot of fun as you can see. We're on posters and speaking and doing all sorts of things. Something that I'm very proud of is we have the largest creative finance Facebook group in the world, not only because of the size of its members, but because of how frequently our people are doing deals. This is a free group. We don't have anything to sell in there. Jamil and I are on a TV show on A&E. We have six years signed and we are currently the most watched TV show on A&E. It's kind of weird to think that my paycheck says Disney on it. YouTube channel, we are gonna hit 100,000 subscribers probably this month and we are primarily focused on creative finance. So thank you guys for watching this on the YouTube channel. Please hit the like and subscribe. Every video that we put out, I'm gonna tell you, it costs us between 500 and 1,000 dollars with payroll, overhead, taxes, insurance, all the things that it costs to run a big massive team. It's very expensive to produce one video and we have over a thousand. So you do the math on how much money we've spent. You know, Instagram, who cares? TikTok, who cares, but we're doing okay. That's not really where my journey starts, obviously. The brand was built at some point. So where it all started was the way I was grown up. I lived in creative finance houses, all of that stuff. I grew up in a Mormon home, learned how to work very, very hard. In fact, I ended up going on a Mormon mission and I went to South Korea. I knocked on over 10,000 doors in a two year lifespan. Sorry, not lifespan, but a two year span. I learned not to follow everybody's success because here's what's funny. How many doors do you think I actually knocked on, 10,000, that converted into baptisms into our church? I'll give you a guess. It's zero, okay? You don't have to guess. I'll just tell you the answer. I knocked 10,000 doors. Why did I knock so many doors? Well, I knocked so many doors because that's what I was told I was supposed to be doing, and I'm good at following instructions up until a certain point when I get a headache from banging my head against the wall. And so at some point, what I did is I actually started telling the Korean people, I had, I had a lot of baptisms, had a great success in my mission, but I started telling Koreans, we will teach you English for free for 30 minutes if you allow us to teach you the gospel of Jesus Christ for the other 30 minutes. Yes, I used to sell Jesus as a living. It's one of the reasons why I'm a great salesperson. So I became successful in my mission by learning to give people what they wanted before before I asked for what I wanted, this is also a very key element in creative finance. So I've always been creative in this aspect. I figured out how to give people what they want in Korea in order to then bring my message in. It's kind of like the Trojan horse thing, right? Like, here's a gift, but I'm hiding something inside of it. The difference is we're being very transparent of like, hey, I want to teach you about Jesus, but you don't want to listen to me. What if I give you 30 minutes of English teaching you how to speak English, and then I gave you 30 minutes of the gospel, and that was a trade-off. And oh my gosh, they ate it up. It was great. We had a success. In fact, all of the missions in Korea have now started doing way more of that. In fact, if you ever go to your mission in Korea, you'll find that those strategies and tactics are still being utilized today. Kudos to me for thinking outside of the box. Okay, I get home from my mission. I go and work in a manufacturing plant. I had great success in that business because I would rearrange where people stood in order for those people to be really successful. In fact, I have one of the greatest stories of all time of my life learning why I didn't want to go to college. In fact, it was this business that I was working the night shift. The night shift became so successful under my tenure, under my management, that the night shift was actually doing double what the day shift was doing. When originally the day shift was set, the night shift was set up to just take over the overflow of what the day shift could not complete. They were the ragamuffins, the lost people, and I turned them into the superheroes and they actually overtook the day shift and the whole day shift got fired, which was amazing. But at this company I also had, I learned why college was not a good fit for me. The reason being is my college professor came and asked me for a job while I was working and managing this ladder company that we were managing ladder or building ladders. Well, that manufacturing experience rolled into this business, which we built things for the gas and oil industry. We ended up having uh, the crash of 2008. It was an absolute horrendous situation and I found myself jumping from tanks into golf balls. And I learned how to raise private capital. Now this is about when I'm 24, 25 years old. I went and became a partner at this company and raised capital to build the growth of this 
eco-friendly golf ball company. This is Don Cheadle from Avengers. Don Cheadle was our main spokesperson, loved the golf ball, and uh, we had all sorts of other celebrities. It was a lot of fun, but you have to sell a lot of golf balls to make a lot of money, and so this wasn't a good fit for me, but I did learn how to raise money. I learned how to talk to people about raising capital here, which was great, part of my journey. I then started a construction business, and I jumped into doing turns for Open Door, OfferPad, Zillow, these big, big, big companies, and ultimately, found out that I wanted to be in real estate myself. And so the only way I knew how to get into real estate at the time was to buy a franchise of We Buy Ugly Houses. It's kind of like if you're a sandwich artist, you go, man, I want to start my own sandwich shop, but I don't know how to start, start my sandwich shop. Like, I don't know how to hire the employees. I don't know the processes, the systems, all that kind of stuff. And I didn't know there, there was such thing as even real estate mentorships at the time. I went and bought this franchise for $135,000. And that's how I jumped into real estate from being a contractor doing seven 7,000 renovations for other people to turning around and then owning a franchise. Now, if I knew how to generate leads and I knew what I was going to talk about today, I would have never bought this franchise. But luckily for me, I utilized my creative brain and who I was to ultimately become one of the top people in Homevestors. Now, the top performers at Homevestors, I became number to uh, number three in all of 1,100 franchises in the country. Now, this is kind of the average, what the, the average top performer, like maybe the top three or 400 people in that franchise model, the 1,100, these are like the top 100 people, right? The top 10% of people. They were spending 20 grand a month on $1,000 per lead. So every time their phone rang, they spent $1,000. And the reason being is because billboards, right? These This is their primary source of lead flow is billboards, mailers, TV, radio, Video, those types of things. It was really, really expensive. And every phone call that I made, or every phone call that I received, it cost me $1,000. So if I wanted 20 leads for the month, I had to spend $20,000. That was the math. Now, a really top performer at Homevestors is usually getting one wholesale deal and two fix and flips per month. How do I know this? Well, I became so successful at Homevestors that I was actually head of the marketing committee of all of the 1,100 franchisees nationwide. I would fly out to Dallas once a month, sometimes once a quarter, sit down with the heads of, of the state, not literally the state, but the heads of Homevestors. And we would talk about how to improve the flow of Homevestors, the frustrations that the franchisees were having. And I became somewhat of a known figure inside of the Homevestors world. Now, this is the, the average Homevestor. This is what mine looked like. I was number three in the country because this is what I started doing. I started taking the same amount of leads, $1,000 per lead, and I figured out, I didn't want to do fix and flip, by the way. I, I was so sick of doing fixing and flipping as a contractor for all those years that I was like, I don't want to do any fix and flip. So 20 leads would come in, I'd spend $1,000 per lead, but my cost per contract, as you guys saw back here, most top performers, their cost per contract was $6,000. It actually works out to be $6,666. But that's why I put the $6,000 plus because I don't want to have the devil's number on the screen. 20 leads, one wholesale deal cost me $4,000 in advertising to get. Second wholesale deal cost me another $4,000 in advertising. Second wholesale deal cost me another $1,000 to or $4,000. Now, how did I get that these numbers? Is because out of the same leads, I was turning sub two and seller finance into real opportunities for me because of the way I was asking my prospects how I could help them, et cetera. And I became really, really good at this. And this is how I became number three out of 1100 franchisees is by utilizing creative finance. I then decided, okay, this wasn't a good fit for me because I told you the top 100 performers, the other 90% of home investors, this is what they're spending and this is what they're getting on a monthly average. They're usually getting one fix and flip for every 10 leads that they spend money on. Each of their leads costs 10, 000, sorry, they spend $10,000 to get 10 leads. That's $1,000 per lead. They get one fix and flip. That means it costs them $10,000 just to buy that fix and flip in advertising costs. I knew this was not going to be a sustainable model. And so what I did is I actually downgraded my lead flow. I changed my way of thinking. I said, you know, I'm not gonna buy 20 leads a month anymore. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna work with probate attorneys and wholesaler dead leads. And this is where I started becoming known in my local state and started becoming known across the country is because I would go to wholesalers and I'd say, hey, you know those leads that you're generating, those 20 leads or whatever? Give me the ones that you hate. And I was figuring out how to make them work. So I would get 10 leads from probate attorneys and wholesalers. They cost me $0 per lead. I would then buy a wholesale deal, a sub two deal, and a seller finance deal every single month. And then over here on my Homevestors revenue, I would still be buying leads. Now the problem is when you're one of the top people at Homevestors, 
People notice when you take your ad spend from $20,000 a month down to $10,000 a month, but your numbers actually go up. They think you're cheating. They think you're doing something illegal. And so all of a sudden, all the eyes were on pace. One day I get invited to go on Steve Trang's podcast back in 2018. At this time, I was a top home investor doing a lot of cash deals, doing a lot of wholesale and doing a lot of creative finance, but I wasn't really talking about it because I knew home investors didn't really want me to talk about it. This was the first podcast I ever went on and unfortunately, Unfortunately, Homevestors sent me a cease and desist. They said to remove all my content. They told me I wasn't the brand and they were the brand and how dare I go on a, a podcast. They told me I was too big for my britches. What are britches, by the way? I don't even know what that means. Told me that I should know my place and that they made me who I was and all of these things. People do tell me I, I'm gonna get burned out all the time. And then what happens is I burn them out. I'm an eternal flame of dragon fire. You'll never burn me out, okay? And then they told me I needed to focus and be more like this person or that person. They would constantly reference other people that were below me in terms of efficiency, profitability, et cetera. And I would just kind of laugh and I got sick of it. So once they told me to remove my podcast from Steve Trang's show, I knew right then and there it was time to sell that business. So what I did is I sold that business. And every time I walk by one of these signs that are close enough for me to take a photo, I would throw up, I'm out, peace out, I am out. I sold that business for $250,000, moved on, and I learned how to generate leads, okay? I learned how to generate leads, but here's how I bridged the gap between home investors and where I am today, or where I, I needed to be in order to learn how to generate leads. I actually started working deals from wholesalers in our, my local market. This is actually a deal from Doug Hopkins, who's in the audience watching today. Doug, I love you, this is a great deal. I bought it for $372,000 which means you know, $372,788, what does that mean? That means I bought this for a very specific dollar amount, which means that that deal was a sub two deal, still is, I still own it to this day, okay? I bought that deal in 2019 and I got that deal from Doug Hopkins, which is great, love Doug. So I got this deal, it was a lead that was sent to me. This was a very, very pivotal point of my career because at this point I wasn't branded, nobody knew about the Sub2 logo, and this house, even though I had done hundreds of creative finance deals up until this point, this was the house that helped me build this brand. Okay, I get the deal from Doug Hopkins. So the ARV was $400,000. Now remember, I am talking to an audience that is higher level than most people. So the ARV, I bought it for 372, 788. The ARV was $400,000. It was listed with an agent and she never sold it. They tried to sell for five months. Couldn't do that without the seller having to write a check. I paid Doug Hopkins $5,000 for the lead. $2,500 to the agent, $2,500 to the seller. After closing costs, furniture, I raised $30,000 in private money. And out of that $30,000, I also, actually I raised $40,000 and I paid myself $10,000 to buy this house. So I borrowed $40,000, 10 grand went in my pocket. The other 30 paid for all the expenses, the furniture, et cetera. This property nets me $36,000 a year after all my expenses, all my fluff, all my everything else. That private lender has been paid off and I make $36,000 a year. And I took $100,000 tax incentive, et cetera. But that's not the cool part about this deal. The coolest part about this deal is that the seller, Dave, by Arsky. In the middle of the night one night, this was creative finance was the only thing that could really solve his problem. Dave sends me a text message at like one o'clock in the morning. He says, man, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you do. And I reply back, I said, isn't it cool what creative finance can solve? And you didn't even know it existed. And he replied back and he said, Sub this is literally what he wrote. He wrote back in a text message. He wrote sub two and he had the emoji for the peace sign and he had an ex exclamation and he threw up sub two like that and i said that's my logo that's my freaking logo and i had lived in korea for two years and everything that you do in korea is this everybody does this all the time and it became a habit for me so every time i walk into a room i'm usually doing this and i just people would always make fun of me because they go is your name pace or is your name peace because all you do is you throw up the peace sign so when dave byarski did that i was like i'm that's my logo i'm gonna brand myself home investors told me that i i wasn't the brand and they were the brand. And so I made the determination that I was going to overbrand myself and talk about every creative finance deal on the planet just to make Homevestors sorry that they ever screwed around and lost me because I was a great asset, Homevestors. Not that you guys care. Okay, so this was a great deal. Thank you so much. Now, then I found out how to generate leads. We ended up 
creating a company called Start Virtual. Start Virtual is the company that cold calls and text messages for us. And this is actually what our business looks like today. So we generate leads in North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, and Arizona. This is my direct to seller model. We only cold call and text message. I don't do any other forms of marketing. And we go after foreclosure, high equity, tired landlord, bankruptcy, low, low equity, divorce, and probate. These are great lists, we love them, they're bread and butter, but here's the difference, okay? The difference is that what's happening with most wholesalers, they'll generate 50 leads, let's say, through this model. 50 people that are saying, I'm willing to have a conversation, I'm open to an offer, whatever it may be. What most wholesalers I'm seeing, this is a really good model, is if you can get three contracts out of 50 leads, that is phenomenal, okay? Phenomenal, like $1,200 cost per contract is kind of where a really phenomenal, this is where I tell my students or other people, if you can get to $1,200 cost per contract and you're getting two wholesale deals and a fix and flip after out of every 50 leads, that's a great model. Now, our model, I got sick of this model. And this is the model I don't like, is that I'm constantly asking, how do I get more leads? How do I get better leads? How do I get better salespeople that can convert more deals? How do I close more deals? How do I how do I take the same leads and get four more deals because of my you know better salespeople or whatever else? But the problem with that is that I don't like dealing with sales people. I don't like having to motivate them every freaking day. It's just not my personality. I'm not good at it. I rather just be the salesperson myself and I know that's a problem. And so we ended up going straight virtual assistance. We don't have a single American acquisition person in our business because we find that we want to have consistency, reliability, etc. And I got sick of asking the question of like, how do I get cheaper this? And how do I get cheaper that? And how do I close more deals? And what we did is we just changed our model a little bit. And I now, ooh, that's not what I, where I wanted that. Or is it? Oh yeah, there, I guess I do want it there. A lot of times that people in this business, I kind of look at every wholesaler, every fix and flipper that I was associating with, I looked at them as the American cowboy. Like they're going out, they're using their ammunition, right? They're taking leads, they're knocking down deals. Take a lead, knock down a deal, whatever it is. But you're you're missing on most of your shots, right? You're, you're missing most of your shots, which means you're getting 50 leads, but you're only killing three deals. And so I really just started feeling like I was like an American cowboy. I was out on the fr wild frontier trying to kill Buffalo. And as I killed Buffalo, the wholesale deals and the fix and flips that I gathered, they amounted. And there's a lot of people in here doing a lot of wholesale deals, a lot of fix and flips. And essentially this is how you feel. You just feel like king of the mountain, okay? And what I realized is that this is not that cool, okay? It's just not that cool. Okay, what I liked was I liked the way that the Native Americans had actually killed Buffalo. And they, realized and figured out how they could actually take down Buffalo and not only not utilize ammunition, this is actually a real cliff in the United States that the Native Americans would drive the Buffalo to the cliff. The Buffalo had no idea they were going there and they would just point the Buffalo in a direction where the Buffalo fell off the cliff and whatever they killed is what they killed, right? They weren't trying to do the one thing that these cowboys were doing, which was just trying to collect the furs. The cowboys just wanted to collect the furs. And so I looked at the cowboys, the American cowboys out in, not the cowboys, but the American soldiers and people and the fur trappers, what were they trying to do? They were trying to make money on just the fur trades. They were looking at today money, but freaking today money is all they could think about. And so what they were leaving is they were leaving Buffalo all over the plains of the United States. And you know what they did is they ended up destroying the entire business. The entire business or the entire population of, the, of Buffalo are now, uh, that one point they were an endangered species, now they've come back. That was because of these guys that were just trying to get the fur from the Buffalo. What I loved about the Native Americans is that the Native Americans would actually take that same Buffalo that came off the cliff. Yes, they were killing Buffalo. They were getting deals too. Just that I don't have to use ammunition on every single Buffalo that I kill. And I'll get to the analogy on that in a little bit. The biggest difference was that they actually used the full Buffalo. So instead of just trying to get a wholesale deal, I started implementing creative finance in my business where I could now, I always have used wholesale. I love wholesale. I've always used fix and flip, but I started using creative finance and that's where I could actually take every part of the deal, every part of the lead, and I could extract these leads and turn these leads into a much more efficient business. Give me way more longevity with way less stress and especially in a down market. So think about this, okay? We've got a market that's changing right now and all these wholesalers that have been running around posting checks about their furs that they've been, pelt, you know, taking off the buffalo. Look at my check, look at my check, look at my check. Guys, I do that too. I have no problem with that. Make all the money. Meanwhile, they're over here, like not realizing how much meat they left on the bone, how much more money is here, how many more solutions, how many more things they could do. You know, the buffalo were one of the best soaps, the best tools were made from buffalo bone, the best jerky, the best everything. And buffalo jerky is one of those things that could last for three, four, five years if it was smoked and salted properly. 
So I look at that and I'm like, man, these guys thought that the benefit of killing the buffalo was just the fur. And that's where I see a lot of wholesalers are running out there and they're just asking themselves the same damn question. The same question is, how do I get more of these buffalo? How do I get more ammunition? How do I get cheaper ammunition? Meanwhile, I'm saying, why not just take what you have already and just start utilizing every little piece of it? So when a seller wants too much money, okay, that's my lead that comes into my system. I'm not throwing it away and saying, sorry, I can't do anything with it. I figured out how to make it work. I figured out, okay, well, you you know, this part of this lead tells me that I could use the horns for X, Y, and Z, or I could make a toothbrush out of this, or I could make a basket, or I could take the lining of the liver and turn it into this, or a t-shirt, or whatever else. This is what I wanted to be. I knew that I wanted to make sure I extracted every piece of value from that buffalo as to not waste my opportunities, okay? I did all the work. My tribe put themselves in danger. I took the risk on of being a business owner. Why would I not want to make sure that every single lead that's coming into my system is being utilized properly? Okay, look at this. The wholesaler or the fix and flipper is just looking at the pelt, just looking at the fur. Meanwhile, you've got teeth turning into necklace. You actually, they had to use the brains from the buffalo to tan the hide, okay? They used all the way down to the brain. You guys can see every little thing, horns, head headdresses, containers, clubs, cups, spoons, ladles, fire carriers, toys, bull boats, masks, saddles, drums, blankets, moccasins, floor, like it is crazy what you can do when you start getting creative. Now, what's the difference between the cowboy and the Indian? The difference is the Indian utilized creative methods to sit down and figure out and test things until they figured out what worked. Meanwhile, the cowboy's like, I'm taking down this buffalo. I can see on the outside of this buffalo, the only thing of value. And they wouldn't extract any further than that. Meanwhile, they destroyed the entire Buffalo population, which is what happens in business when the interest rates change. The interest rates change. And what happens is all these wholesalers are now, Pace, come speak on our stage. Pace, come tell us how you're doing this with creative finance because all we have are furs. All we have are furs and we don't have anything to hold this through the winter. We don't have meat, we don't have this, we don't have tools, we don't have whatever. And so what we did is we started changing up the way we do stuff. So I take the same 50 leads. I'm gonna jump into a couple of things with you guys here in a moment. So I take the same 50 leads, right? Cold callers, texters, seller says they're interested in having a conversation. Obviously we're gonna do the same two wholesales and same fix and flips as anybody else. That's an ideal business. I'm not gonna be able to take these same 50 leads and just get four more wholesale deals because I have a better salesperson. That's not how this works. Some of these sellers don't need cash deals. Some of these sellers actually have tax implications. In fact, I've got a couple of deals I'm working right now where the seller's like, I can't take cash. Don't buy my house cash. I need to sell to you on terms. So I have for years and years taken the same leads that everybody else is taking and I add one sub two deal, one seller finance, or maybe one Morby method or other type I'm gonna show you here in a minute. I'm taking the same buffalo and while you guys are focusing on the fur or the hide of that buffalo to get the immediate action, the immediate money today, Day, I am making sure I'm extracting all the value of every single lead as to never throw them away. Now, how am I doing that is through this crazy mind map deals. And these are all the ways that I exit those deals. And so for me, this is the way that the Native Americans operated. They go, how am I going to catch this buffalo? Yeah, I could shoot the buffalo. I could bow and arrow. I could jump off my horse and cut that buffalo's neck. I could push the buffalo over the cliff because that doesn't cost me any ammunition. Also taking dead leads or doing other things, referrals, those types of things. That's a free lead. I'm going to take this free lead and I'm going to push it to where I want it to go. This is for the Native Americans what this is for for pace and creative finance. So let's talk about the acquisition strategies ideals, then sub two, obvious seller finance hybrid. I'll show you guys a couple of examples of hybrid deals today. Executory contracts, gangster love executory contracts. There you have their own rhyme and reason for when you need them. Lease options, novation agreements, short sales, Morby method, or a dating contract. Most people don't know what a Morby method deal is or a dating contract. And so I will walk through those with you guys here shortly. Again, I'm gonna be very, very clear on this. I'm not getting different leads than you are getting. I'm I'm getting the same leads. I'm just asking different questions. And I also understand the game. Why is it that the cowboys or the American soldiers would kill a buffalo? They take all the hide. Meanwhile, they would leave that buffalo behind and then head back east so they could sell the furs. And along the way, they're like, damn, I'm hungry. Damn, I needed this. Damn, I need a toothbrush. Damn, I wish I had a water bottle. I wish I had this. Meanwhile, they left it behind. This is what a lot of people in real estate are doing. Real estate agents, wholesalers, fix and flippers. They're just not utilizing every part. All the meat is left on the bone, in my opinion, okay? Here are the acquisition strategies. Again, cash, sub two, sub 
seller finance hybrid, executory contracts, lease options, arbitrage. So like Airbnb arbitrage or other forms of arbitrage as well. Novation agreements, Morby method, dating contracts, and short sales, which I rarely, rarely do. Okay, those are the 11 acquisition strategies. And underneath these, unfortunately, for people that don't know, executory contracts have like 15 different strategies within executory contracts. Not to overcomplicate this, but I just did. Okay, so here's a sub two deal. Here's a deal that I bought two years ago. This is a really great one. I wanna break your brain on this real quick. This is a seller that had no equity at the time. 288,079 is what I bought the property for, as you guys can see. And it's currently worth 408,800. So I've made like 100 and $30,000 on that deal, just having it sit there, which is great. On top of the cash flow, the tax benefits, the pay, the, 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 all the other cool things that I've got with this. But at the time when I bought this property for 288,079, the seller's name is Xavier. The seller, Xavier, had just bought this property a couple of months prior with a VA loan, which means he didn't put any money down. So now if he didn't put money down and he goes to sell it in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months, he's actually gonna have to come out of pocket. Well, unfortunately, Xavier didn't have the money to come out of pocket. Wholesaler contacts them, agent contacts them, et cetera and nobody can make the deal work. So the deal ended up coming over to me. We navigated this deal and we ultimately bought it subject to, gave the seller $0 down. I told the seller, I'm not paying for closing costs. You're gonna have to pay the closing costs and give me the house. Seller says, I don't have the money to pay the closing costs. I go, no problem, just reimburse me. And he's like, what do you mean reimburse you? And I go, I'll pay for the closing costs and every single month I want you, how long do you think it'll take you to pay me the $5,000 of closing costs? He says, I think it'll take me probably four years. I go, no problem, we can do that. And so every single month, Month, Xavier sends me $147.05. For the next couple of more years, he's gonna have to pay that. He's been paying it. This was just a couple of months ago. Every single month, $147.05 comes to me from a house that I took over from free from Xavier, and he is still paying me to this day for the closing costs I paid two years ago. That is what Creative Finance does for you. Now, this property cash flows. I paid myself up front, okay? It's completely furnished and it's an Airbnb in the Vegas area, which is great. Here's a dating contract. I love this dating contract, okay? So a dating contract, I'm gonna break a couple of people's brains that don't realize this is possible, but it is completely possible. You will get sellers that say, I want too much money. I actually, I don't care what I bought the property for, but I bought it for $600,000. It's these 35 units right here. I actually can't kind of write on this, so why not write? You know what I'm saying? Mine is right here, okay? So I own this property, 2871 Fifth Street in Yuma, Arizona, and there's 30 35 checks that come to me every single month from this one mobile home park. Now, what's great about this property is I told the seller he wanted $600,000. Every wholesaler is like, I'll buy it at 400 or cash buyers are saying they'll buy it at 400. And I go, I took, go to the seller and I go, hey, look, I'll buy it for the $600,000 that you really want. Happy to do that. But I wanna give you $0 down. I want 0% seller finance. But most important is I want to make no payments for a year. And the reason why I wanna do that, Mr. Mr. Seller is I want to make sure he says, why would I do that? Why would I give you $0 down and 0% seller finance? I said, I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. Because you're going to get the $600,000 that you're asking for. And I'm going to get the thing in return that I need. Okay. This is going back to me in Korea teaching English just to give them what they wanted to ultimately turn around and ask them to let me talk about Jesus. And praise the Lord, this is a great deal. I'll tell you that much right now. This deal, he says, okay, well, if I get the $600,000, why wouldn't you make a payment to me for a year? And I said, because actually he fought me on this, fought me on this wouldn't let this deal work. And so this is what I told him. I said, look, I want to date you for a year. You can remain the owner of the property. I just want to have a contract on the deal. There's no way this deal is going to work without doing a dating contract. So it stated that if I upheld my terms of the agreement for a year, that he would then seller finance the deal to me at 0% seller finance and $0 down. So here's what the dating contract was. Starting effective immediately, I was on paper the owner. It's just that we didn't finalize the transaction. And we would finalize the transaction once I took the payment payments that were currently being made and I managed the renovation of this mobile home park and revitalized it and raised rents to a point over the course of a year that it was actually worthy of probably $500,000, not $600,000. And then he could see that I'm a serious investor and then he would sell it to me for $0 down, 0% seller finance. So in these situations, dating contracts where I actually don't become the owner immediately, but I effectively take control of the property, this property allowed me to date the seller, show him my worthiness to
to ultimately have him seller finance the deal to me. I do now own this property, but I did it through a dating contract as to build trust with that seller through a different strategy than most people have ever heard. So I called that and I created that a dating contract. When I brought that up to my attorney three, four years ago, he's like, oh my gosh, that's so freaking genius. I love that. And so we ended up doing that deal, still own it to this day. That's a dating contract. Dated the seller to overcome objections. This is a great deal. Just bought this a couple of months ago. It's a sub tail deal, sellers in foreclosure. I paid myself $15,000 up front. So you guys that are wholesalers that are saying, well, I don't want to go after sub two or seller finance because I need to get paid today. Guys, there's ways to structure these deals without having to come out of your pocket on any single deal. So I paid myself $15,000 up front. We will net $50,000 on the exit. I just bought it about a month ago or so. That was a great deal. Here's another really great one. I call these unicorn deals. A unicorn deal is $0 down, 0% interest, and the seller dictates the payment. So they actually wanted a higher payment than really what was worthy of them. And it needed $37,000 in repairs and closing cost of 50,000. And I paid myself $40,000 upfront on this deal. I raised $85,000 from a private money lender. I turned it into a sober living exit and I now have both 0% seller finance, $0 down, paid the closing costs, the renovation and paid myself 40 grand all upfront with somebody else's money on a deal that the seller wanted too much money. $0 down, 0% interest. Crazy how much money I will make on this deal. And I made $40,000 upfront. The seller was actually working with a wholesaler, with a wholesaler, with a wholesaler, an agent of this, that and the other. And the seller just wanted too much money and I ultimately asked the right questions and I got the seller to sell the property to me through seller finance. This is a great one, fully renovated. We're buying this, it hasn't closed yet, but they just bought it. They bought it a couple of years ago. They don't have a lot of equity. And so they're letting us take it over for $20,000 to the seller, three and a half percent interest. It's already renovated, furnished and an operating Airbnb. Great deal right there in Atlanta. This one's pretty similar. This one is a great deal. I gave the seller $0 down, 4% interest. And the seller is actually seller financing this deal to me for 50 years. 50 years. The reason he's giving me 50 years is because he doesn't need the freaking money. Okay. I actually brought other people to the property so I could let those people hear from the seller directly. Oh my gosh. Sellers do this all the time. In fact, this is a $3 million deal, 43 units, immediately bringing in $30,000 a month. My payment to the seller is 11 grand. After all my CapEx, my vacancy, all of my management fees, everything, this property on day one nets me $7,500. But guess what? If I was going to buy this thing cash, I would have paid $2.5 million for it would have paid $2.5 million. So this is a phenomenal deal. Seller finance, same thing here. Just closed on this actually like a week ago, 30 units, $3 million, 5% down payment. This was really smart of me is the seller says, I want 10% down. $300,000. Now for most people, you'd say, okay, well, that's a lot of freaking money. That's a lot of freaking money. Well, great. How did I structure this deal? I actually told the seller, nope, I'm not going to give you a down payment. But what I will do is I will dedicate 5% of the seller of the sales price, 150 grand as a down payment to you, but I don't want it to go to you. I want to go towards the renovation of the property so that you can get what you want security and I can get what I want, which is a fully renovated property for the $3 million. So the seller says, okay, that seems reasonable. We worked out the deal, 4% interest, 50 year note and no balloon. And he has 25 more million dollars in real estate. We're slated to buy over the next year in Corpus Christi. I'll own 3% of Corpus Christi in a year from now, which will be great. You can structure your down payments however you want. You can structure them to go and do whatever you want. Meanwhile, a wholesaler is like, this is not a deal. It's a great deal. It's two blocks from the ocean, 30 units. It's going to cash flow on day one. And I didn't on this one, but I could have structured a way for me to pay myself. Okay. This is a great one. I just took this from a, another high level person. This one's great. Just took it over a fully renovated, fully furnished deal in Lake Worth, two blocks from the beach. This is a phenomenal deal. I'm not going to go through this deal. That'll take me three minutes. This is awesome. Okay. Now this is my personal house. So this is what we call a hybrid deal. So a hybrid deal, I actually bought this for 3 million, but Zillow recorded this at 2 million. And there's a very specific reason why I bought the house with a underlying sub two. So the primary lien or the first lien position or the senior debt, which is first position, $1 million sub two loan with Zions National Bank, that Mormon bank I told you all about, Eric. $800,000 in seller finance at 0% interest and a $1 million consulting agreement. Okay. So the consulting agreement was off book, didn't raise my taxes, which is great. And because the seller of this property is actually in our industry, real estate, I was able to set up a $1 million consulting agreement that when I pay that consulting agreement every single month, it's actually a tax deduction for me towards my business. And 
And because that seller moved to Puerto Rico, that seller gets only taxed at 4% instead of selling this property to me for 3 million. Now, my neighbors hate me, obviously. Here's a great deal I'm working on right now, 75 units, Morby method. So the way this works is the seller's selling this property to us for $20 million, okay? It's only worth about $18 million, but we're gonna pay $20 million. And the reason being is because we're coming out of pocket, no money. The way that this deal is working is that I'm going and getting senior debt, okay? I'm going and getting debt at 50% of the purchase price, so $10 million, which is great. And I am then having the seller carry back the other 50%. So it's a 50-50 deal. So in this situation, I actually do have to use credit. I have to use credentials. So the Morby method is a little bit more challenging in that regard. But here's the great thing, is that the $10 million I'm giving the seller and the $10 million the seller is carrying back, the seller is receiving $10 million. I'm already losing some people right here, which is great. It means your brain is expanding. And you're like, wait, well, oh, what? What's going on? Out of the $10 million the seller is receiving, they're going to carry back and refund us back $1.8 million to do repairs, rental turns, all that kind of stuff on the property so that we can also have all the cash we need to renovate and clean up the property from the seller receiving it from our down payment. Now that down payment, all I had to do is qualify for it, but my lender is the one that brought it to the table. So that's a great deal. Here's another deal. I'm actually closing on another Morby method this week, 105 units in Louisiana. This is a great deal utilizing the Morby method. Here's what I wanna do for you guys. I know that I'm at 47 minutes. All right, I'm at 47 minutes right now. I think they, I was only given 45 minutes. So what I wanna do is I want to, I'll open it up to q and I'm sure there's a couple of questions. I'd love to answer those. I wanna give every single person in this room a sales masterclass where I will put a private Zoom on for your sales guys, just me. You guys are welcome to be there as well, where I'll show you guys exactly what questions to ask to take the same exact leads and push them over. I will also teach them how to navigate the seller situation and figure out the right flow in order to get those buffers to jump over the cliff themselves without using any ammunition, essentially just guiding people to where you want them to go. And then I will also do an exit strategy masterclass where you guys bring your dead leads to me. I won't be the buyer, but I'll show you guys how to structure them. I'll talk to your sellers. You guys can buy those, keep those deals yourself. And I'll walk your salespeople through a process that I walk through and I'll teach even more in depth on exit strategies for your people based on real live deals. That is the value I wanna bring to you guys today. And I hope that you guys have gotten some value from me so far. So let's Let's open it up to some Q&A. For those of you guys watching this on YouTube, this is actually a presentation I'm doing here in about, let's see. I'm doing this presentation in an hour and 40 minutes and I wanted to go through it. This is always a smart thing to do for you guys is that if you are going to be on stage, get in front of a live camera, get the pressure and the heat, like put a mic on yourself, get the lights on yourself and feel what it's gonna feel like when you're on stage, time yourself. This is something that we should have done for Clever Summit. You and I did a good job of like working it out in the hallway, but like everybody's like, Pace, Pace, hey, can I talk to you? Pace. Same thing yesterday, I was speaking at, a, at Scale and Escape for Kent Clothier and unfortunately I was being pulled every which way and I couldn't write my talk. And so when I started my talk, I hadn't gone through my flow and I did probably 70% of what I really set out to accomplish in that session. So here now on my drive up there, I'm going to be thinking like, what did I like? What didn't I like? You ever have a conversation with somebody and you leave that conversation and go, man, if I would have just said this, I forgot. But when you're in the heat of the moment, you can't remember what you're supposed to say. So you got to practice, screw it up. And then on your way to the conversation, then you'll be prepared and you'll remember a couple of those things. So hopefully you guys like this and hopefully it was helpful for you guys to see what creative finance is all about and how it benefits everybody. It's why I love the Indian theme and the Cowboys and Indian theme is in my house. I love that whole thought process of like wholesalers and fix and flippers, the Cowboys destroying the business. You're not really destroying the business, but you're destroying opportunities for yourself. And then the Native Americans are the ones that are going through and utilizing every single lead to its fullest potential. So this YouTube video is all about Cowboys and Indians. We'll see you guys later.